I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 will be our text this Lord's Day. Uh, If you've been with us over the last couple of years, we've been walking through 1st and 2nd Samuel, and we're going to return to that study next Lord's Day. But today, uh, we're going to take a look at part of Paul's letter uh, to the believers in Philippi. Now, if you're not very familiar with Paul and with Philippians, uh, Paul we're introduced to in the scripture as Saul during a time that he's a religious leader and he is persecuting the early church. Uh, But then God converts him. He brings him to faith in Jesus. And so from that point forward, uh, Paul becomes a great Christian missionary. Uh, Over the years, he travels, he he plants churches, he shares the gospel, uh, but ultimately he is imprisoned for doing these things and for his faith. And at the time he writes this letter uh, to the Philippians, uh, he's been a follower of Christ for nearly 30 years. Uh, He will be dying within just a few years, and he is under house arrest at this point. And it's during that time that he's writing to encourage these believers in Philippi. And so we're going to pick up in Paul's letter uh, in Philippians chapter 3. And I'm just going to read for us verses 7 through 11. And so now that you are nice and comfortable seated, seated, I'm going to ask you uh, to stand once again out of reverence for God's word if you're able to. We stand because this is the holy inspired word of God. And this is what that word says. Philippians chapter 3, beginning now in verse 7. Paul writes this. But whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You will pray with me. Father, this is your word. We ask that you would teach us from it today. That you would transform us through it today. That you would help us and enable us and empower us to walk by faith. As we trust in Jesus on this day, this resurrection day. We ask that you bless our time now in your word. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Nearly 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Simon Bar Kosova. He claimed to be the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. And the city of Jerusalem as a whole believed this. They would sing his praises and referred to him as the star of Jacob. They believed that he would truly be the one who would finally overthrow Roman powers and would reestablish the people of God. And so in 1832, he captured Jerusalem from the Romans. He ruled that as an independent state for two and a half years until there was a battle with the Romans that he lost. He was defeated, he was executed, and he was buried. 300 years later, there was a man named Fiscus of Crete who began to go by the name of Moses. He, too, claimed to be the long-awaited Messiah, and many began to follow him. On one occasion, he told the people that, like the Moses of old, that he would actually lead them through the sea. And so they lined up on a cliffside, trusting that he indeed was the Messiah, that he indeed would lead them through the sea. And sadly, many of them met a tragic end as they left from that cliff and died and perished. Others made it to the water only to drown. He ran away immediately. And was never heard from again. 
1,200 years later, a rabbi named Sabbathai Zevi led a messianic movement that attracted thousands of Jewish people who believed that he would finally lead them back to the promised land. In 1666, he was captured and imprisoned by the sultan of modern-day Turkey. He was given a choice either to be killed and die a martyr or to convert to Islam. And so he chose to convert to Islam. And not only did he convert, he led many of his followers to convert as well. And so he was freed and he was rewarded and he lived out his days as a Muslim. He died in 1676. 300 years later, in our day, an aging rabbi named Menachem Schneerson was hailed by many to be the true Messiah. His followers simply referred to him as the rabbi. They said of him, Moses was the first redeemer. The rabbi is the last redeemer. It's estimated that as many as 300,000 Jews believed that he was the Messiah. And even as he was dying, paralyzed by a stroke, many believed that he would recover, that he would come to Israel, that he would rebuild the temple. And yet that never happened. He died in 1994. All these men failed to do what the prophets of old said the Messiah would do. They failed to defeat death. But there is one who did that. Now that is what our Messiah, our Lord Jesus did. That is what we commemorate on this resurrection day that Christ not only went to the cross, died in our place for our sin, but he was raised from the dead. He defeated sin and death. He did what no one before him and no one after him was able to do. And it's because of this event, it's because of the resurrection that we can gather today and we can worship today and we can celebrate today. Everything about our faith hinges on the resurrection. And so on this day, this Resurrection Sunday, I want to encourage us to remember what it is that has been accomplished through the resurrection of Jesus. And what it is that God has provided to us through the resurrection of Jesus. That our hearts might be full and that our hearts might be thankful on this Lord's Day. So we're going to look briefly at three things that we see here. In Philippians chapter 3, three things that the resurrection of Jesus provided for us. I've outlined these in your notes there. We're going to see how the resurrection provides us with a saving faith, a sanctifying faith, and the hope of a future glory. So we'll begin with the first point there in your outline. The reminder that the resurrection indeed has provided us with a saving faith. Now look again at what Paul writes there beginning in verse 7. He here is writing in the context of telling the believers there in Philippi all the things that he let go of, all the things that he gave up in order to truly follow Christ. See, Paul was a very religious man and he'd accomplished a great number of religious things in his life. But now he's looking back on all those things and he says he considers them rubbish. Now that word for us, rubbish, it doesn't seem so vile, but the, the Greek word used there is something very vile. He's saying this is, this is human waste. And when he considers all these things he once prized and treasured, now he considers them to be waste compared to the resurrection of Jesus. Again, he says it this way, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You can almost picture Paul here with a ledger. And in this ledger, Paul is writing down on the page of the ledger all the things that he once counted as a gain. He said, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And so now all these things he once said that were gain, now he says they are loss. Why? For the sake, his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And so on Paul's ledger, he would have perhaps in one column all these things that, that previous to him were gained. His religious accomplishments. 
that the family that he was born into, his, his religious spiritual heritage connected to that family, all the things he once treasured, all the certainties he once had, all those things that gave him security in his life and faith. And as he writes those things down in the gain column, then he comes to this point in his life where he's radically changed by the gospel of Jesus. And now he's looking back at that ledger, back at those gains, and he's saying, all these things I once considered to be gain, now I consider them to be loss. He realizes as he's looking back that the faith that he now has was not earned by his religious accomplishments. That the faith that he now has was not secured by the family that he was born into. That the faith that he now has doesn't rest in his power and his abilities. It rests completely in the resurrection of his Lord Jesus Christ. It's a faith that's come from Christ's righteousness, not Paul's attempts to be righteous. And so in essence, this, this new kingdom math that he's doing, these things he treasured, they aren't so much of a treasure anymore. Why? Because he treasures something greater. Some of you are familiar with the 19th century Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon, in looking at this passage, he, he described it this way. And he said, imagine you have a, a ship's captain, and, and it's at port, and the ship is being loaded up with precious cargo. And that captain would then go and inspect that cargo. He would instruct his men to inspect that cargo. Perhaps they would have a ledger, and they would go through, and they would measure out all the things they had been entrusted with, all the things they prized and treasured. All these things that were of great worth to others made them of great worth to them because if they could safely deliver those goods to their destination, well, they would receive their reward. They would receive their payments. That they would treasure those things. They would want to secure those things. They would tie them down neatly. They want to make sure nothing happened to them. The Spurgeon says, Imagine then while at sea if that ship were to encounter a great storm. And in that great storm, the, the captain of the ship were to realize that the ship was too heavy, that the ship would not survive, that everyone would perish unless they could lighten the ship. What would they do? Well, immediately they would go and they would take that precious cargo and they would begin to throw it overboard. Those things they once prized, those things they once treasured, they didn't treasure them as much as their life. Spurgeon said it this way, Overboard go valuable bales of merchandise. Nothing seems to be worth keeping. How is this? Are not these things good? Yes, but not good to a sinking ship. Anything must go to save life. Anything to outride the storm. And so the apostle says that in order to win Christ and be found in him, he flung the whole cargo of his beloved confidences over and was glad to get rid of them. He did this to win Christ. Friends, as you consider what, what Paul is saying here, as you consider that, that, that picture that Spurgeon gives, the, the question for us today is this. What, what's holding on to you? Or what are you holding on to? What, what is it that you're unwilling to throw overboard for the sake of following Christ? Well, what is it that is weighing you down today? What is it that you are desperately grasping for? What is it that you treasure today more than anything else? And if you find that whatever that is, if it's anything other than Jesus, then the call of the gospel is to loosen that grip. To be willing to throw that cargo overboard. That you might attain what it is that Paul is striving for here. To know Christ. And the power of his resurrection. To know this saving faith he offers us. And it's not just a saving faith. We also see that it is a sancti sanctifying faith. That comes to us through the resurrection. The second point there in your outline. The resurrection provides us a sanctifying faith. So Paul essentially looks back and he says. I, I threw it all overboard. I got rid of all those things that were weighing me down. That the prize before me, the treasure before me, was to know Christ and to be conformed into the image of Christ. He said it this way in verse 10, that I may know him, know Jesus, 
and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. This process that Paul is describing here is what we refer to as sanctification. A sanctification is becoming more and more like Jesus in our day-to-day lives. It is growth in our Christian life. It's a sanctifying work, and that work occurs when we know more about God through His Word, and we seek to live like Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And of course, that begins with our response to the gospel. And the gospel simply says this, that while God created in the beginning all things good and all things holy, that man sinned against God. Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the garden. And as a result of that rebellion, as a result of that sin, the consequence was death. That consequence would carry over through the pages of Scripture, which teach us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of our sin is death. But that consequence would also point us towards a promise that God gave all the way back in the garden that one day a Redeemer would come, that Redeemer, our Messiah, our long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ. And God tells us in this word that he demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that if we'll confess Christ as Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, if we will believe on Resurrection Sunday that the resurrection actually took place, if we will trust in Christ, God tells us we will be saved. He says all who call on the name of the Lord are saved. But, but it doesn't end there. It, it begins there. Because then at that point of salvation, at that point where we trust in Christ, at that point where we throw everything overboard, well, then the ship continues. We go towards our destination, our final home, a new heaven and a new earth. In between this point and that, we grow in our faith. And we seek to become more and more like Jesus in our faith. You see this in the Scripture where we read, about the the power of the Holy Spirit to help us do this. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 22, speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. And so as a result of becoming Christians, as a result of this saving work, this is the sanctifying work. This is the growth we should see. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires I understand that what this passage is teaching us is not that we need to work really hard at becoming more loving but that if we just try our hardest we'll become more patient No, this passage is not saying we need to grit it out and make sure we do these things. What this passage is saying is that as a result of being transformed in our lives by the gospel of Jesus, the Spirit of God works these things out in our life. And and how does the Spirit do that? By showing us perfect love, perfect joy, perfect peace, perfect patience. And where do we see that? We see that in the resurrected Christ. And so as we look to Jesus, as we learn from Jesus, we see how Jesus perfectly did these things. And then if we belong to Jesus, we want to be like him. And we grow in these areas, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You might think of it this way. For some of you, you grew up in a home where you wanted to be like your older brother or sister. Now, I realize maybe some of your older brothers or sisters are worthless, so this illustration won't mean much to you, but let's just assume for a moment that someone here had a decent relationship with an older sibling. And in that relationship with that older sibling that was a healthy one, there were probably things about them that you wanted to emulate, that you wanted to do. Perhaps you started into a a sport or activity because they did that and they excelled at that, and because you wanted to be like them, you did that. And maybe not even an older sibling, maybe a friend, maybe an acquaintance, just maybe someone you even knew not so well, but, but you looked from a distance at them, you saw the things they did, you wanted to be like them. And so you did the things they did. 
their interests became your interests. Their pursuits became your pursuits. The Scripture teaches us that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a perfect elder brother. The Scripture teaches us that, that when we confess Jesus as Lord, we, we become sons and daughters of God, that we become co-heirs with Jesus, that, that Jesus is the perfect older brother. And, and this sanctifying work is the work through which we, we want to be like our older brother. We want to do the things he did. We want to be like him. Not in our strength, not in our flesh, but empowered by the Holy Spirit where we're called to transform into the image of Christ. And the good news is this, while he's our perfect older brother, we are certainly the imperfect younger brothers and sisters. But Christ is not ashamed of that. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 2.11, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, and that's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. You think of that truth for a second, friend. Some of us are ashamed of people in our families. We're ashamed of friends at times. We're ashamed of other people. Why? Because they, they do something that we think would embarrass us, would shame us, would shame our family name. They, they disappoint us. They let us down. Well, think of how that must be to our holy, perfect elder brother when he looks at us. Now, I realize I'm, I'm looking at you guys right now. You're looking at me. I can tell you this. Y'all are a bunch of messed up people I'm looking at right now. You're, you're just looking at one messed up person. I'm looking at a whole room full of messed up people. And I, I can say this with confidence just based on, on myself. That there's a lot for Jesus to be ashamed of in looking at me. I, I've fallen short I've struggled to have faith. I have sinned. I've had periods over and over again where I said, well, well, I did that, but I'm never going to do that again, only to do that again. I have fallen far more times than I've ever gotten up. And if my faith rested, if my faith was secured by my ability to be faithful, then that's pretty hopeless for me. But the good news of the gospel is we have a perfect elder brother who looks to us in all our mess-ups. And he's not ashamed of us. In fact, he died on the cross for us. He, he rose from the dead for us that we might have a saving faith and a sanctifying faith that he might be in the business of making us more and more like him day by day. And friends, that's the good news of the gospel. And that's the work we see in the resurrection. This, this saving faith, this sanctifying faith. And last point three there in your outline. This faith that gives us hope and a future glory. Paul writes here that he wants to know Christ. And he wants to become like Christ so that, verse 11, by any means possible... I may attain the resurrection from the dead. When Paul here writes about the resurrection from the dead, he's writing about the, the future glory that awaits all followers of Jesus Christ. He says that his desire is that he may attain by any means possible. Now that phrase may attain can also be translated might attain. And when you read that way, it, it seems to introduce some degree of uncertainty from Paul. And there is uncertainty there, but we need to be clear, especially in light of everything else Paul has written, that Paul is not uncertain about whether or not there will be a future glory. Paul is not uncertain about the power of the resurrection. Paul is not uncertain about an empty tomb. Paul is not uncertain about a saving faith and a sanctifying faith. What Paul is uncertain about is he doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next. He knows the final destination. He knows the hope he has in a future glory. But he doesn't know what he's going to encounter before he gets there. You see, Paul at this point in his life, he, he has already suffered greatly. And he's going to suffer more. 
He's ultimately going to suffer martyrdom. He's going to be killed for his faith in Jesus. Paul doesn't know all of that at this point. But what he does know is that there is a future glory that waits for him. In essence, what Paul is saying, he, he's going to attain it. He's going to receive it. He just doesn't know what's going to happen between this day and that day. And, and I think... That's a fairly hopeful statement for us today. That this reminder that while we aren't certain about what's going to happen today or tomorrow, we, we can have great certainty about what is to come. That, that we don't know how much we're going to suffer or what our sufferings are going to be, but we know there will be a day when all suffering ceases. That we don't know what trials we're going to endure. But we know the one who's going to get us through those trials. And we know that the day is coming. That future day of glory. And therefore we hope in that day. That's why Paul wrote, not long before he wrote this letter to the Philippians, he wrote another letter to the Roman believers. And he said this in that letter. Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that has been revealed to us. Paul, in that statement, is not saying, you're struggling? Get over it. But Paul is not saying, you know what you need to do today? You just turn that frown upside down. And Paul is not looking to us in our pain and our trial and our suffering and saying, well, listen, just... Just fake it until you make it. No, Paul's saying get the ledger out. And you list off everything that you have suffered and everything that you will suffer. And then on the other side of the page, you write this. Future glory. And when you put that on the scales of eternity, when you consider the magnitude of that, when you consider the greatness of all eternity and all that is to come, when you line that up and you put this little speck on the map of that, of our life on earth and the trials we face, Paul says, it's not even worth comparing. And so friends, that's where our hope is on this Lord's Day. On this day when we remember the resurrection of Jesus. On this day when the nations are raging. On this day when it seems that the world has lost its mind. On this day when so many people have lost their way. On this day of uncertainty in the world around us, we can have great hope. If our hope rests and the resurrection of Jesus. Is that where your hope is today? And if not, then friend, we invite you to put your hope in the resurrection and to put your hope in Christ and to have the hope that is guaranteed for us in a future glory that God has prepared for those who have trusted in Jesus. And so we invite you to have that hope as we celebrate that hope and now have a time to respond to that hope if you'll stand together as I pray for us and as we prepare to respond to God's word. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the hope of the resurrection. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that when we get out our ledgers, when we look at all the things that once brought us security and confidence and the things we strove for, we thank you that we can look at those things and consider them rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. The, the saving work of the gospel, the sanctifying work of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for this work that you have done and are doing and will do in our lives. And so we pray now that you would help us to rightly respond to your word. I pray, Father, during this time of response that you'd help each of us just to take a moment to reflect on what your word says to us.
I pray, God, that our hope would be in you and our trust would be in you. I pray, Lord, for anyone here who's yet to respond to the call of the gospel, that they would bow their knee to Christ today. And I pray, Lord, for our, my brothers and sisters who have bowed their knee, but perhaps today find themselves suffering in trial, suffering in disappointment. Lord, I pray that you would remind them, remind us in our suffering that the day is coming where there will be no more suffering. Lord, that you would give us a resurrection hope today on this Resurrection Sunday. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church family and guests, we're going to respond to God's word now by lifting our voices and singing. We call this a, a song of response because we're responding to the truth of God's word. And the primary response, the primary way to do that this morning is just to lift your voice and sing about what it means to be found in Christ and in Christ alone. And as we sing together, I'll be available to pray with you, to counsel with you. If God's leading you this morning to come and to confess Christ as your Lord, to start the process of believer's baptism, of joining this church family, if you just need someone to pray with you, I'd be privileged to do that on this Resurrection Sunday. So we invite you to sing, to pray, to repent. We invite you to come as we lift our voices together and sing in Christ alone. Mm -hmm.